Second Thessalonians under the heading, The Light in Light of His Return. Now, we have, in, we have in our congregation seven study groups, and that involves over 80 people. What I'd like to say this morning, there are room for more. And I know a number of you have said to me over the past number of months, uh, I'd be considering joining a group, and you maybe haven't taken that step. So what I'm telling you this morning is, or suggesting to you this morning is, that you take this opportunity now to join a home group, and I know you won't be disappointed so please do speak to me after the service. And can I say, if you come along even for a taster night, just to see how it all happens, you won't be asked any questions, you won't be asked to pray, but you will be made very welcome. And uh, as I say, uh, we would love more folk in the congregation to take part in that ministry, which is very important. So speak to me after the service, and I can sort that out. Just one other thing, church membership classes, Andrew plans to run a short series of classes in the spring for anyone wishing to explore the possibility of becoming a communicant member of the congregation. And if you're interested in taking part in these classes, please give your name to Andrew. Uh, that could be at any time during the week or indeed any of the elders, and we can sort that out for you. Services next Sunday. Graham will lead the uh, morning service and the sacrament of the Lord's Supper will be celebrated uh, at the evening service at 6.30 p.m. And Andrew will lead that service. After this service, tea, coffee, and juice will be served at the end of the service. And again, I'm making a plea. If you haven't stayed for that, consider it this morning to stay behind. You never know. You can make a new friend very quickly as we share that in fellowship together. These are all the announcements. Thank you, Philip. Good morning. It's so good to be back again here in Elmwood. It's always good to be here on this particular Sunday. This is a bit of a, an annual fixture, an away game for me, if you like. And uh, I know that Glen Torren are playing an away game in this area in a few weeks' time. I want to let you know that I am a lot nicer and indeed a lot better than those East Belfast visitors who'll be coming in a few weeks' time, and it's always great to be here um, with you, and it's great to have Andrew and Connor as well. We actually say that Balamina is near Connor rather than Connor near Balamina because we kind of believe we're the center of the world up there, but it's always good when Andrew is up there, and uh, I've been praying that this will be a good time for all of us and a time when God will be glorified and Christ will be exalted. Today, as we come to worship the Lord together, we turn to his word and the opening verse that I want us to think about as we come to worship the Lord is found in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. And Paul writes, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And often in his letters, Paul uses that phrase. And when he begins something, with that phrase, he's really just saying, sit up, pay attention. This is something that is so important for you to hear. And this is what he continues to say. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. And we can echo those words of Paul today. If we're believers in Christ, we realize our incredible need of God's grace and the salvation that is found in Christ. We know how sinful we are, but we are so grateful for the grace and the love and the faithfulness of our God. So let's sing together in worship of him, standing to sing this wonderful hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Let's then continue in worship of the Lord. Let's pray together. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we have come here today to worship you. And we are so grateful for those words that we have been singing and the truth of those words. Lord, towards the beginning of another year, we can look back over our lives. We can look back over the past year. And Lord, we recognize challenges and difficulties that many people have walked through, but all of us can testify to your faithfulness. Lord, we worship you today, thanking you that you have made yourself known to us. We know that you have revealed yourself through your creation. Lord, we think of this world and all of the incredible things that we see in this world and all of its majesty is like a big finger pointing to your much, much greater glory. And so we worship and we exalt you today, our creator God. And we bless and thank you, our Father, that you have made yourself known through your perfect law through your word. Lord, it, it amazes us the way in which you inspired writers to, to pen the words that you wanted them to say to people. And we believe today that you speak to us so clearly through the scriptures. We look forward to reading and meditating on your word because it is you speaking so clearly to us and we praise and thank you for it. And most of all today, we praise you for, and indeed we praise the one that your word so clearly points to, the living word, Jesus Christ. We meet here today in his name. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And so our desire and our, our prayer to you is that by your Holy Spirit, the name of Jesus would be lifted high today. We know that Jesus is the radiance of your glory, Father. He is the exact representation of your being. And he's so worthy of our worship today. And we thank you that he came into this world, not only to make you known in that perfect way, but he came to save us to rescue us from sin and the hold that it has over us and the consequences that we face because of it. Lord, our minds turn to the cross where Christ died. And we realize that like the Apostle Paul, we can only be truly grateful for the cross and all that happened there when we consider what we are like. And so we confess our sin today. Lord, we identify with the words of Paul. We are able to say, I am the worst of sinners. And yet, Lord, we marvel at the truth that while our sins, they are many, your mercy is more. So we come sensing our need of your grace today. We come with that attitude of the, the hymn writer, John Newton, who, looking back over his life, was able to say, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. And so as we think of all that the Lord Jesus was willing to do for us, all that was achieved through his perfect life, his death, and his glorious resurrection. We say of him today in worship, hallelujah, what a savior. Lord, may it be the case in this time spent together today in the name of Jesus, and then in all that follows this coming week, and indeed in this coming year, that we, like John the Baptist, would say and would live out that Jesus must become greater 
and we must become less. Lord, our prayer today is that he must increase, I must decrease. And may it be so, especially in this time of worship, and all for the honor of Jesus Christ, and for our blessing as well, as we ask this in the Savior's name. Amen. So, boys and girls, I can see lots of you are around here today. You come down to the front. I'll meet you in just a moment, and we'll talk together. It is so good to see you all coming down. We've got some, I think this is good. Some of, some of the older guys are coming down. What, what age are you? 11, 11, brilliant. What age are you? 12, that's brilliant. You see, in my church, I can't really get people to come down after they're about nine, so I'm gonna go back and tell them. Look, in Elmwood. Brilliant. Well, look, I am so pleased to see you down here at the front today. And I'm really glad to be here. I know that ministers say that, don't they? They say, oh, I'm so glad to be here at this church. And I am. I'm glad because I think you know that Andrew, your minister, is my brother. So that's nice that we have this swap every year. But I'm also glad to be here because when you set off on a journey, you can't just guarantee that you're going to get there on time. And I know that there's at least one other minister here today, so they know what I'm talking about. When you set off on a Sunday morning, you always have it in the back of your mind, what if, what if I get a puncture? What if my car breaks down? What if I get delayed? That would be really embarrassing to run into Elmwood 15 minutes after the service has started and out of breath apologize to everyone and say, I'm sorry, I didn't make it on time. So it's good to be here. My car is a wee bit older and sometimes it starts to make slightly weird noises and I'm always glad to get to the end of my journey. But I want you to imagine today what it would be like if I was driving from Connor, which is near Balamina, so it's over 20 miles away from here. If I was driving from Connor to come to Lisburn, to come to Elmwood, and I was about halfway through my journey and something started to go wrong with my car. And instead of going faster, it started to go slower and slower. And then it just went boom and stopped all together at the side of the road. Now, that would not be a good thing, would it? I would be in trouble and I would need, what would I need if that happened? What would I need if my car broke down? I would need Exactly. I would need help. I would need someone to fix it. So if I got out of the car in my suit and I don't have a clue about how cars work, I just don't know very much about them at all, but I managed somehow to find, I know where the bonnet opener is, so that would be a good start. If I lifted the bonnet and pretended I knew what I was doing, but realized I'm in big trouble, I would need someone to fix it. I would need help. So I want you to imagine that first of all, there's a car that comes down and the car pulls over and a guy gets out. This man gets out and he says, oh, you having a bit of trouble? Yep, yep, the car's broken down. Oh, look, I'll help you out. That would be great, wouldn't it? Uh, and, and, and I would probably say, you know, because you always apologize, I would say, I'm so sorry. To, oh, don't worry about it. I'm glad to help. I really want to help. But it wouldn't be so good if he went to the back of the car and he started to open the boot and he said, let's just have a look at the engine. Well, sorry, actually, the engine's round here. And he might say, you know, he might try and bluff it. He might say, but some cars have the engine at the back, but not a Peugeot, come on round here. And if he started to look and he started to kind of poke around and then, you know, the wee place that you can ask your mom and dad to show you this where you put in the stuff to clean your windows. He opened that up and he said, I think if we put a bit of petrol in this, we'll get you going. And I would have to say to him, well, actually, that's where you clean the windows, and this is a diesel car. But So I then realized that this guy, he wants to help, 
He told me that he's glad to help, but the problem is he doesn't have a clue about how cars work. He knows even less than I do, and that's saying something. So he would just have to go on. And he meant well, he wanted to help, but the problem is he wasn't qualified. He didn't know what to do. He wanted to help, but he wasn't able to help me out. Is that any good to me? No. So next, I see this big transporter coming down. You know the kind that when a car breaks down, they lift it up, and I wave it down, and the guy winds down his window, and he looks out. What's the problem? Well, my car is broken down. What's it got to do with me? Well, can you help me out? No, I haven't the time. See you. And he just revs on and goes up the road. Like that guy is a mechanic. That guy takes cars away when they're broken. He could help me, but does he want to help? No, he can help. He's qualified to help but he doesn't want to help. He can't be bothered. Is he any good to me? No. So last person comes along and the car pulls over and a girl gets out of the car, young woman, and she says, are you having trouble? And I, yeah, my car is broken down. I've got to get to my brother's church. Long story, but I need to get this fixed. Well, imagine what it would be like if she turned around and she said, well, then it's as well for you that I'm a mechanic and I've got stuff in the boot. Hang on and we'll have a look at this. And of course, I would have to be polite and I might say to her, and you're sure it's, oh, no, look, it's no problem. And if she had a look in and she did poke about a bit and she said, ah, right, that's the problem there. And I don't even know enough about cars to make up what the problem is, but <laughs> she kind of... Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it could have been out of fuel. That could be the problem. But anyway, she, she turns something around. Try that now. The car starts. Amazing. Was she able to, to help? Was she good? Yeah, because not only did she want to help, she was willing to help, but she could actually, she could actually do something as well. She was qualified to help. And that is what makes all the difference. And this is what I want you to think about today. I want you to think about the Lord Jesus because when we come here to church, it is all about Jesus. We meet in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is his church. It belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to anybody else. And we come here to tell Jesus how much we love him and so that we can be helped to follow him. And there's a song that we sing in my church about Jesus. And when you get home, maybe you could ask your mom or dad, or you could ask someone at home to help you find that song online. It's called Jesus, Strong and Kind. And it talks about those two things about our Jesus, our Lord Jesus, that he is strong he is a mighty God. He's the Son of God, and He is kind. Now, what does kind mean? What, do, what does it mean to be kind? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Kind is being nice. It's helping people. It's wanting to make a difference. And so, when we live our lives, if we love Jesus, that's really good news for us. Because sometimes we have problems. Sometimes there are things that happen in our lives and they make us sad. Sometimes we don't know what to do next. And it's not only the boys and girls here today who sometimes feel like that. Mums and dads, grannies, grandas, aunts, uncles, all of us feel like that sometimes. But when we have Jesus as our Savior and we have Jesus as our special friend, he wants to make a difference. He cares about you. He is kind. And he can make all the difference. He is strong enough and mighty enough and powerful enough. The Bible talks about him having authority. That means that he is strong enough to make all the difference in your life and in the life of this church. And we know this 
because of the cross where Jesus died. That shows how much he loves us. He was willing to die for you. And we know this at the cross because Jesus did not stay dead. He rose again and he beat death and he's alive today. And we know how great he is. And so if you need help, at times if you're worried or you wonder what to do next, know that when you trust in Jesus, you have a savior, you have a Lord who is strong, who is kind, one who wants to make a difference and is able to make a difference in your life. Now that's good news. And I think we could maybe pray, we could talk to God and thank him for his son Jesus and ask for the help of Jesus. So what I say to everybody in my church uh, and when I'm in assembly and stuff like that is that when we're speaking to God, we can close our eyes because that helps us to think about what we're saying to him so that we don't want to speak to somebody else. Let's close our eyes and we'll talk to the Lord now. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that he is strong and kind. We thank you that he is loving enough, that he wants to make a difference, that he is powerful enough, that he can make a difference. We thank you that he gave his life so that we can have everlasting life with you when we trust in him. And I pray your blessing on all of the boys and girls up here at the front today and their families as well, that you would help them to remember this and to trust Jesus in the year that lies ahead. And in his strong name we pray, amen. And so when we know this love of God and we know how much Jesus loves us, then we want to do what we're about to sing about. So I'm gonna get you to stand up and we're going to sing together, love the Lord with all your heart. And you've listened so well today. And we're going to now to praise God. Let's turn together in God's Word today as it's found in 2 Timothy. So we're going to turn to 2 Timothy 
chapter 4, towards the end of that short book of the Bible. And I'm going to read from verse 6 down to verse 10. So quite a short reading. And listen really carefully to what we're hearing from God's Word. Indeed, if you've got your Bible with you, if you've got a Bible in front of you, then why not look along at what we're reading together from God's Word. 2 Timothy 4, and we begin our reading in verse 6. And this is God's Word that we're hearing together today. Paul writes, For I am already being poured out, like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. And we end our reading there in verse 10. And we give thanks to God for this reading from his word. Amen. Well, I want to thank all of those who are helping out uh, in our service today, including our musicians and our singers over here and those down at the back at the AV desk who are keeping everything going so well. And we're going to take time to worship the Lord together just before our, our kids leave us at that stage of the service by singing back to back two great songs of praise together. Yet not I, but through Christ in me, and then holy forever. So please stand as we sing these songs. If during the singing of them you need to sit down or take a bit of time out, please feel free to do that. But we'll stand in the worship of the Lord together.
Let's pray as we turn to God's word. Father, we love you and we love your word. Lord, the way in which you reveal yourself to us. Lord, we love the gospel of grace. And we pray today that as we take time in your word, that this would be glorifying to you and that it would be so helpful to us. Please 
speak to us by the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. For Christ's sake, amen. You know what it's like when two items are placed right side by side so that the, the contrast between them stands out so much. In fact, sometimes we try and keep away from other people or we try and keep away from other things to avoid that comparison. For example, when I go out to walk my dog, I wear what is known in my household as my dog walking gear. Most of it stays out in the back hall, a good place for it to be. And I get on waterproof trousers because that's just the way it is in this part of the world, isn't it? I get on my 20-year-old coat and my hat and I head out for a walk. And when I get the dog back again, I'm about to come back inside. And sometimes my wife would say, you know, we really need milk or we need bread. And I think, really, I should go up and get changed, and then go over to the shop, but who can be bothered? Sure, it's a quick in and out, I'll go over to the shop. And in that gear, I go into our local super value, and inevitably I bump into the Church of Ireland minister and Connor, who is dressed like the Archbishop of Canterbury, <laughs> about to head out to do a, a funeral or something like that, and he stops to have a chat, and of course, as we are chatting, a wee old dear from Connor Presbyterian Church walks in, and she kind of looks at him, and she looks at me, and she thinks, yeah, typical. <laughs> side by side, the comparison has been made. Or when we lived in our first home when we got married in Newton Abbey, it was one of those mock Tudor fronts. It was a semi-detached house, and it seemed like a nice idea at the time, but of course we realized that every couple of years you needed to paint the white part white again to keep it looking anyway fresh. And the problem was always when the house that you were attached to, they went out at the start of the summer and they painted their part white so that your house just looked awful. Side by side, the comparison was made. Well, here, if you turn in your Bibles again to 2 Timothy chapter 4, within the passage that we read a few moments ago, the comparison is made. We have side by side two people who were part of the early church, and yet the difference between them could not be greater. In fact, seeing them side by side emphasizes for us how good an example one is and how much of a warning the other provides. So I would encourage you to look again at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 6 to 10. If you've got a Bible in front of you, whether that's on your device, and I trust that you're looking at the Bible and not Instagram or something like that, or if you've got a good old paper Bible and you're looking at these verses, for many of you, you will be seeing a division in the verses that we're looking at by a subject heading there. And this might sound incredibly obvious, but I think that at times it's worth pointing this out, that when the writer of this book, in this case Paul, and the writers of the Bible were first writing these books, they did not add in those numbers. So the chapters and the verses came much, much later as a good, a useful way of helping us to guide our way around the Bible, but that was not the way in which the Bible was written. And it might be obvious, but it's good also to state that when Paul was writing this letter, he did not include those subject headings that divide the letter up. So for some of you, you'll be reading the NIV. I think it says there, personal remarks. Some of you will be reading the ESV or another version, and undoubtedly at that point in what we have been reading, there is a break, and we tend to read the Bible accordingly. And while it, it's really helpful to have those subject headings, at times they can be almost misleading, because I, I don't want anybody to imagine that when Paul was writing this letter, that he had these subject divisions in mind. And if we read this letter as it was first written, if we read this passage as it was first written as a continuous line of thought, then we're able to see this huge contrast 
between these two people. The two people are Paul, and we know much of the Apostle Paul and his life, and we'll think about that life in, the, in a moment, and then Demas, of whom we know much less, but we know that Demas was a disciple of Jesus. He was a co-worker of Paul in the gospel. He was involved in gospel ministry. And side by side, we get to see the very different directions these two people went in after they made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's dive into this passage and think about these two men side by side. First of all, thinking about Paul. And I reckon there are two things about the letter that we're reading from that it's worth knowing to get the most out of what we're thinking about today. The first is this, that in terms of the letters of Paul that we have in the New Testament, this is the final one to be written. This is the last one chronologically. So that it was written around the year 67. Paul was in prison in Rome and he was about to face execution. While that execution is not recorded in the Bible, all scholars are agreed that Paul died for his faith. He was put to death because of his love for the Lord Jesus. And the other thing that's worth knowing is that Paul here is writing to his closest friend in ministry. And that's what it's like for us as ministers. We have colleagues that we're especially close to, and there was a special bond that existed between Paul and Timothy, who was a fellow worker in the gospel. In fact, elsewhere in this letter, Paul talks about Timothy as being like a son in the faith. That's the kind of bond that existed between these two men. So that as we read this letter, we can say that it is both prophetic and personal. That's to say, this is God's word to us. It is a word that is inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that what we're reading here was not only for Timothy, it is for you, and it's for me, and it is useful for us, but also alongside that, this is a personal letter. Never forget that. So that we get to see the heart and the mind of Paul in a special way. Because towards the end of his life, realizing what lies ahead and speaking to his closest friend, to someone who is like a son, he, he bears his soul and he writes very deeply about his experience of following the Lord Jesus Christ. So that if you look at verse 6, Paul shares with Timothy some intimate, deep thoughts. He knows that his time in this world is coming towards its end. So he says in verse 6, for, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. And the picture that Paul paints there is of the, the drink offering that was offered as part of a sacrifice. It would have been wine that was poured on the altar. And the idea was that the fragrance of this wine was pleasing to the Lord. It was a, a fitting sacrifice to him. And it gives us a clue. It gives us a real indication of the way in which Paul looked at his life, that he saw his life as being a sacrifice to the Lord, that what his life was geared up to be all about was pleasing the Lord day by day. And now that that life was approaching its end, take a look at what Paul was able to say about this life of discipleship. It's summed up there in verse 7, and it is a wonderful verse. He puts it like this. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And the way in which Paul looks at the Christian life is so instructive because these are descriptions of the Christian life that help us to better understand what it's all about. But not only that, these are descriptions that then enable us to look at our own life. At the beginning of this year, to take a look at ourselves and ask ourselves, where am I at with the Lord? Is this what my life looks like? Look again at what Paul says. He, he tells us, I have fought the good fight. And elsewhere in his writings in the New Testament, 
Paul talks about warfare. He uses that picture, for example, in in Ephesians chapter 6. He talks about putting on the armor of God. But that's not the picture that Paul has in mind here. Instead, he is thinking about a sporting fight. For him, it would have been a wrestling contest and not like that kind of fake wrestling that, you know, they have in the States and everybody running about and diving. This was like Olympic wrestling. It was a big struggle. And we might think of a boxing match, a fight like that. And what Paul's really saying is this, the Christian life involves struggle. And that might come as news to some people here today. In fact, that might be disappointing for you to hear. Maybe you're coming along to church and you think, well, hang on, I do not want to be engaged in a struggle. Life is difficult enough. That's not what I'm signing up for when I say that I'm a follower of Jesus. But I need you to know from God's word that when you become a disciple of Jesus, when by grace you are brought into relationship with God through Christ, then know this, the struggle is real. That struggle is both internal and it's external. What I mean by that is it is internal because when we come to Christ, when God by his grace calls us to himself and saves us, the Bible tells us that we become a new creation in Christ. We become a whole new person, and yet there is still the old sinful nature lurking deep within, and there is this struggle that is going on in your life as a Christian between what you have become as a new creation, but that old sinful nature that is still there. The Holy Spirit is at war with your old sinful nature. And sometimes you actually sense or feel that struggle as you fight temptation and sin. But the struggle is also external as well. Because the Lord Jesus warned his disciples both back then when he first spoke these words and those who are disciples today that we will share in his rejection. He puts it like this. If you look at John 15, verse 18, John chapter 15, verse 18, he he puts it really starkly. He says, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me first. So if you encounter opposition as a believer, if we encounter opposition as a church, either at the micro level in work or in our own home or at at that bigger macro level in society today, know that it's because of Christ. It's not all about you. It's not all about me. It's because of the one that we trust in and the one whose name we bear, the Lord Jesus. And yes, walking with Jesus brings joy and it brings peace and it gives us great help in our life. We hold on to those promises from God's word. But Jesus wanted his disciples to be sure that there is a real cost to following him. And Paul certainly knew this as he faced execution. He was lying in prison as he wrote these words, knowing that the outcome, humanly speaking, for him was not looking good. Paul knew this, but I wonder, do we? Because it seems that we have forgotten this. That for us, the Christian life has become about contentment and comfort and the expectation that we will have ease and that there will be little commitment along the way. But Paul said, I have fought the good fight. And then he continues, I have finished the race. And know that when Paul said that, he had a race over a distance in mind. The Christian life really is a marathon and not a sprint. And I think that nowadays we're well geared up to understand that the picture that Paul had in mind in this day when park runs are so popular and apps like Strava, lots of people are out there running. I see that every single day. And it's such a helpful picture because it's a reminder to us that when it comes to the Christian life, there is both a starting point and a finishing point in this life. And so you need to make it to the start line if you're going to take part 
in a park run or a 10K or some other kind of race. And the Christian life has a starting point. We think of what the Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You have to be born of the Holy Spirit. It is a work of God that happens in the life of someone who comes to Christ. But then you need to keep on to the finish. And that's the part that we tend to forget, that for many people, the Christian life is really just a glorified life insurance policy. It is a trust in Jesus that I tuck away in my inside pocket and forget about unless I really fall in to a time of need. But this is a race that keeps going to the finish. And it's only by God's grace that we can continue in this life of discipleship. In fact, the Lord has given us what are described as means of grace, ways to help us to continue in this race. The church, this gathering here today is part of that. That's one of those things. Of course, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that we're thinking about now, prayer and we'll pray in a few moments' time at the end of this sermon. Means of grace to help us to keep on in the race. And I wonder, do you use them? Is that a priority for you as we are entering into this year? And then he says, I have kept the faith. And really, the first two pictures are leading to this crucial point. They're just other ways of expressing that by God's grace, Paul had been able to keep the faith. Yes, he was in prison. Yes, he was facing execution. Yes, he was discovering what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and the real cost of discipleship, but he still trusted the Lord and was keeping on with him. And so what about you? How's your life looking at the beginning of 2024? But we said at the beginning that side by side, we get to see a contrast. And in this passage, that's the case. Very briefly, let's think about the other person mentioned here, Demas. Because after Paul reflected on what it had been like for him living as a follower of Jesus, he finishes this letter to Timothy with personal greetings and instructions. And if you look at verse 9, you see his great need of the support of other people. He says to Timothy, and it's a real plea, do your best to come to me quickly. I need your help. And he then explains the main reason why he needs the comfort and the support of other believers. He explains it in verse 10. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. What was it that had happened to this guy, Demas? What was going on? Well, in the New Testament, we have three mentions of Demas, and they point out that he was a gospel worker. This is the, the thing to understand. He was engaged in Christian ministry. And the second one of those mentions chronologically is an interesting mention. In fact, if you look at Colossians chapter 4, and you'll see that Demas is mentioned in a long list of people in verse 14. And yet, if we look at the list from verse 10, let me read this really quickly and listen out for the, the praise, the good comments made about the other people in this passage, so that if we go from verse 10, I'll read it quickly. Paul's is mentioning various people, and he says, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about them, if he or about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. And then he adds in verse 11, Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. And he says about them all, These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me tick, a big, big tick for them. Then verse 12, he talks about Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus. He also sends greetings. 
And then the bit, he is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. And he says, I vouch for him that he is working hard for you. And then finally, verse 14, a, a term of endearment, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and then Demas, send greetings. And note that it's just Demas full stop. Now, when I was at Union College, and you'll be glad to know they do try and teach us about how to preach and how to interpret the Scriptures, we would have been warned, and it's a good warning, to be really careful to not read into a passage what is not there, and to be really careful that we don't jump to all kinds of conclusions. And yet, when you read that list, and when scholars who I've read who are a lot more intelligent than I am note this list, they make the same point. There's something that is slightly odd here. All of these people mentioned and praised, and then Demas right at the end with no further comment. It would be a bit like if you came to Connor. And what a wonderful place to go to, by the way. But if you ever came to Connor and you came to our service tonight and you got talking to someone when we have tea and coffee after the service this evening and they tell you about their lifetime in Connor and they say, and we had Mr. Preston and he was a great minister. He really grounded me in the face, such a faithful teacher. And then we had Richard, who was a really good man and he did so much around the church. And during that time, we had assistants, Matthew and Michael, really godly guys. And now our minister is Philip Thompson, full stop. <laughs> and be honest, you would be getting back out into the car and thinking, what's the story with the guy who's there right now? And yes, we need to be so careful that we don't read into what is not there. But by the time we get to the final reference to Demas in this passage here, in 2 Timothy 4 verse 10, it becomes abundantly clear. Paul says of Demas, because he loved this world, he has deserted me. And be really clear about this, that this deserting of Paul, this deserting of gospel ministry, points to a much greater desertion from the Lord. And we can only speculate as to what happened to Demas next and the precise reasons why he walked away. And I hope that by grace Demas was restored, that like the, the prodigal returning not only to the loving arms of his father, but to his useful service, that Demas came back to serve the Lord once again. And know today that for you, that God's grace that first pardoned you in Christ if you have drifted away, is a grace that can bring you back and restore relationship once again, if that is needed in your life at this time. But what a warning Demas gives us. Someone involved in Christian ministry, a gospel worker who ended up spiritually nowhere. And so as these two people appear side by side, well, what a contrast it is. And I ask of you today, who do you resemble? Are you keeping on? Or are you beginning to drift? Or has the drift been for some time where you're valuing more of what the world can offer than what the Lord has given you? But as we finish, well, here is the, the danger of a sermon like this. And you, know, you might not imagine sermons to be dangerous things, but they can be. And here's the, the danger of a sermon like this, that as I hold up these two guys side by side before you today from God's Word, that all of a sudden it can become all about us. So that for you, your instinctive response to what you've heard is this, oh, well then, I must fight harder. I must run better. I must be more like Paul and not at all like Demas. And of course, there is here an example to follow and there is one to avoid. But you know what this shows us most of all is our great, great need of God's grace. In my Christian life, 
I have been helped so much by the writer Paul Tripp, and in particular by his devotional book, New Morning Mercies. Everywhere I go, I recommend this book to people. I recommend it to you. It's no exaggeration to say that this book has made an absolute difference to my Christian life in recent years. And yet, in recommending it, I also realize that if you then get it, maybe next year you'll come up to me and say, why does that guy repeat himself so often? I mean, just you get to February the 2nd and then March the and he seems to be saying the same things. That's the whole point. Every single day he keeps the gospel of grace before people. And this is one of the things that he often says. And I love this and I've been helped by this. You're as much in need of God's grace today as the are you first believed. Never lose sight of that. And we can only imagine what life was like for Demas after he walked away from it all. But we know how it was for Paul. Because we finish with this verse, verse 8, where Paul is able to say, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And if you read that verse and you think of Paul, that boy has got some attitude. He's got some big ideas about himself. If you think this is Paul bigging himself up, then you don't know Paul. Because all the way through his writings in the New Testament, he emphasizes what our salvation is all about. For example, in Ephesians 2, on two occasions in that passage, he tells believers, it is by grace you have been saved. And he knew that this crown, this amazing reward that he would receive was not because of him, it was because of Jesus. That the righteousness that he speaks about here is not a righteousness that he had managed to live out, but a righteousness he received from Christ. And that's how it is for all who put their trust in Jesus and keep on trusting. That he put on a crown of thorns, and he died a criminal's death so that you can receive a crown of righteousness from his father, your father. Side by side, we get to see the amazing contrast between two men who started out in the race, who looked at Jesus, but then their lives went in very different directions. And so what about you today? What do you cherish most? What do you look forward to most? Is it all the stuff that this world offers and tells us is of value, but actually has no lasting value at all? Or is it something of eternal value and purpose? A right relationship with God through his Son, that assures you of an amazing future. Let's pray together. Our loving Father, we thank you for your word to us today. And we thank you for the grace that it points to. Lord, we confess that the righteousness that we have in Christ is not a righteousness of our own, Lord, we confess today that there is nothing that we have done which achieves us a right standing before you, but it is through what your Son has achieved, through his perfect sinless life, through his worthy death, and through his wonderful resurrection. And I pray that you would help this church here in Elmwood to proclaim this gospel in the coming year and to do that faithfully. I pray for Andrew and for the Kirk session and for all who work here that you would give them grace to enable them to continue to make Jesus known. And what we pray for this part of the world, we pray for the mission of the church right the way across the world. 
today we pray for Ukraine and the Christian church there for gospel witness in such a dark situation that you would protect and encourage pastors and congregations who are seeking to be light in the darkness. And all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's then sing of this amazing grace and the impact that it has on our lives as we keep on trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.